Hi again, this is Tony Nichols, the senior pastor of Church Alive in Northwest Arkansas. Welcome, and it's a pleasure to be able to share just a few minutes with you. I've entitled what we're going to look at today, The Challenge of Perplexity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 13, let me read to you, and if you would, listen and follow along. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, containers, so that the extraordinary greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who live are constantly being handed over to death because of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, life works in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what was written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore also we speak. May the Holy Spirit give us all revelation and insight, and may we be able to apply what we learned today. We all face the challenges of perplexity from time to time. It may not be the word that rises up in our thoughts, but we all experience it. What is perplexity? Let me define it as this, bewilderment. Just almost at times, circumstances and situations and things we encounter that we're just exasperated or it's like, I don't know what to do with this. Sometimes it leads toward confusion, and although God's not the author of confusion, he'll use this. And we're not sure what to do yet. The idea of perplexity is I don't know what to do yet. We face challenges and circumstances that are not quickly solved or easily resolved. What should we do? What does a season of perplexity indicate in our lives? Are we being punished because we're out of the will of God or with sin? The simple answer is that, no, that's not what perplexity really means. Certainly, if there's sin or there's something we're missing, the Holy Spirit's going to talk to us, convict us, convince us. But sometimes perplexity has a completely different purpose. So what does it mean if we find ourselves in a place of perplexity? God uses building blocks of life and circumstances to prepare us for the future. For example, think about Moses, Joseph, Job, and Esther, just to name a few. God called them. They went through the process of life and some really perplexing situations. But in their maturity and their leadership, they went from being called and a good leader to a better leader to a great and excellent leader. That's part of the purpose of perplexity. Let me just give you four quick truths about perplexity. Perplexity is not a sign of being in a low spiritual state. Stop looking at what's wrong. If you've done something you know, confess it, repent, put it under the blood of Jesus. Stand up and start walking again. You're forgiven. And find the Lord in the midst of your circumstance. You are cleansed by the blood. Find what's right. And ask this simple question, God, what are you doing and saying in my life right now? So perplexity is not a sign of a low spiritual state. It may be something that God is allowing because he wants to do a deeper work in you. Sometimes perplexity is a sure sign that spiritual battles going on around you. James chapter four says this, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Sometimes when we find ourselves in a place of bewilderment, a bit of confusion, not sure what to do yet. The Lord is beginning to speak to us that we cannot do this in the flesh, that we need to learn to submit and surrender to Him and resist the pressures and temptations that the enemy is going to bring our way. And when we do, the enemy will flee from us. I'm going to share with you a bit of a life experience I had this morning. For some of you that the things of the Spirit are a little new, or you're going to say, huh, that's okay with me, because I'm learning to please God and not so much worry about what people think. I was up early. I was preaching for about um, 
I think, 14 leaders that I had this morning from the nation of Rwanda. My wife is exhausted. She's been working just diligently in the ministry here, and there have been a number of crises in the last two or three weeks. She's uh, had two or three ministries that were handed back to her, and she's been raising up leaders and handing them over. And she works two days a week in a doctor's office. And yesterday was a very long and stressful day. She came home last night just exhausted, went to bed early, woke up in the night not feeling well. And uh, this morning, early, shared that with her work that she would not come in today, that she was in great need of rest. So about 4.30, I arose and began to prepare for this long day. About 5.30, um, she was sharing with me that she was so exhausted. As I came out of the bedroom into our living room, across the room, I saw two things. I saw what I knew was a demonic spirit, and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, depression is trying to enter your home and wants to attack your wife. And then I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to handle this? I know the authority that I have in Jesus, but much to my shock and amazement, an angel appeared and I was trembling. And the Lord said, I've sent help. You speak to this enemy and bind him. And I send an angel to assist you and carry out the work. And so indeed, without great pretense without yelling and screaming, I simply said in the name of Jesus, depression, you are not welcome here. Not welcome to attack my wife or me, not welcome in this home. I bind and rebuke you in the name of Jesus and I command you to leave this place. And I saw that angel simply grab a hold of this thing and out of my home it went. Wow. I just wanna tell you whether we see it or we don't see things in the unseen realm, when we cry out to God and do what his word says, he and his word really work. It was a bit perplexing last night with all the things, and yet God is setting things right. People are volunteering. People are stepping up to minister. And yet sometimes what perplexity does is it presents to us a spiritual battle. The third truth I will give you his perplexity is allowed by God to deepen our trust in him. In our weakness, he is strong. If we're going to continue to do the things that God's put before us, all of us, you, me, all of us, if we're going to continue to advance the kingdom and do our assignments at home in our marriage and family, in the workplace, in the church, in the government, education, wherever it is, we have to understand that we'll never be able to do all of this in our fleshly strength. In our weakness, it reminds us how much we need to walk with the Lord, how much we need to walk in His strength and power, how much we need the help of the Holy Spirit. In our weakness, He is strong. God reminded me this morning, after that encounter, of something that Isaiah 50, 10 and 11 says. I haven't looked at these verses perhaps for three or four years, but let me read them to you quickly. Who is among you? who fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, and yet walks in darkness and has no light. Can that even be? Hmm. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. I truly am trying to fear and revere and honor the Lord and obey what he puts before me. But sometimes I'm perplexed. Sometimes I, I'm in the midst of circumstances and situations where I'm like, Lord, I'm bewildered. I don't know what to do yet. I'm not sure what to do or how to handle this. Yes, I know the Lord and his promises, but I often do not control the timing. I certainly don't control what other people say or think or do. What do I do in those situations? Well, there's a temptation to figure out in the flesh how to try to handle this or how to kind of comfort myself in the flesh, which is not appropriate. What he tells us to do is to keep trusting in the name of the Lord and keep relying on him. If we get into the flesh, here's what will happen. Verse 11 of Isaiah 50. Behold all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with the uh, flaming arrows or firebrands and walk in the light of your fire. And among the blazes that you have kindled, 
This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Wow. Here's what he's simply saying. When you get in the midst of perplexity, don't make a way for yourself. Find the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Talk and listen to the Lord. Trust the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Rely on Him. If you light your own fire, if you try to make a way for yourself when it's not God's way, you'll wind up in a mess and it'll be tormenting. I want you to think of what Abraham did trying to fulfill the promise of God when it wasn't God's timing. And he produced Ishmael, which has produced so much torment and persecution to Israel and the nations because of a pagan God. When he waited and God brought Isaac, the son of laughter and comfort, the blessing came. Let me just move this thing toward wrapping up. So if you're in perplexity, it's not a sign of being in a low spiritual state. You need to find the Lord in the midst of that and realize that you are loved by God. The second thing is perplexity is a sure sign that a spiritual battle is going on around you. Submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you. Sometimes God may allow circumstances to deepen our trust in him and confront our flesh. And then the fourth truth that I would give you, it means a new day is about to dawn upon you. Psalm 30 in verse 5 says this, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy, victory, triumph is coming in the morning. It may not always be a literal day, but it's that metaphor of when you're in a time of perplexity, it will pass. It will pass, and joy and victory will return. In times of perplexity, I've learned to think back and remember the prophetic words the Holy Spirit has spoken over me through others that are truly hearing from Him. And I also call to mind the promises of God. Don't focus on your circumstances. Yes, gaze, a glance at them, they're real. But keep your gaze on the Lord. Go back to His truth and His promises and stay firmly planted there. I don't know how long your times of perplexity will last, but this too shall pass. You will come into a time of great joy, victory, and fruitfulness. May the supernatural peace of Jesus be your portion as you walk through this process into greater victory. Thanks for being with me today. Amen.